everyone. Uh, welcome to another edition of FinTech Talk, where the future of FinTech gets sculpted these days. I'm your host, Patty Ramanathan from the iValley Innovation Center in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is our special edition with Maya and Shamir. But for those who are new here, iValley is a third generation startup factory in the Bay Area, and we host these FinTech Talks to talk about the future we're building with our partners and startups. We've had great engagement with sessions with these sessions on Clubhouse, with topics ranging from the future of crypto economy uh, to embedded finance to the future of wealth management to crypto startups from around the world. And even one show we had the future of media and events. Did you miss these shows and want to be part or wanted to listen in? No problem. We have recaps. Check out the recaps at our sub on our Substack. It's fintechtalk.substack.com. All the li- all these links are also in my Clubhouse profile. But let's get to today's um, show. Let me start with a great quote from Donatella Versace. Um, Creativity comes from conflict of ideas. So I'm delighted to welcome two very distinguished fintech stars operating very creatively, sometimes at opposite ends of the spectrum. And I hope we see some of that today. Please welcome Maya Bittner, um, ex-engineer turned fintech nerd, angel investor, part of the the lead group of Forbes 30 Under 30. Um, She does some startups and some other stuff as well. We'll hear about that. Um, she's also voice of the member at a popular challenger bank. Welcome, Maya. Hey, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, excited to duke it out with Shamir, talk about where the, uh, you know, kind of forecast the greatest improvements to um, Americans' financial options. Awesome. I look forward to that. And um, good friend, I've met him in person, um, uh, Shamir Karkal, co-founder and CEO at Sila Money. He was previously the co-founder of Simple uh, for those who've been tracking fintech for a long time. It's um, admittedly the first uh, challenger bank. Welcome, Shamir. Thank you, Patty. And uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it is, it is kind of weird to think that we actually used to meet in, in person in the before times, uh, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and now it's, you know, it's life is, life is virtual, but, but I have met Maya in person as well. Um, uh, what was it like 18 months ago in, in New York again, just before the pandemic, um, uh, good to be chatting. Great. Yeah, no. And I paused when I said I met in person because yes, uh, I've met a lot of people in the last 18 months, which who I have not met in person and Maya is one of them. And I look forward to meeting Maya in person as well. I, I believe we are in the same kind of general area, Maya. So I look forward to that happening as well. But today, today, let's have some fun as well. So I'm going to ask some provocative questions. And I hope to see some heated arguments as well. But let's have some fun. So before we get into the meat, let's get a quick round of introduction and opening remarks from each of you. Talk about what you're doing now, but also how you got here. And let's maybe start with Maya first. Yeah, happy to uh, kick it off. So, you know, I uh, always been very interested in financial sector just as a consumer. Um, but my career really started, I had an e-commerce business. Um, and so I've tripped into fintech, uh, really looking at my e-commerce business and how to optimize our customers' happiness, their LTV, their retention, all of that good stuff. And what I found was uh, our retention and our LTV, right, were really suffering because of Americans' financial health and because they were really struggling to manage their money um, in this in this new age. And so that's, that's how I ended up in fintech. Um, I started a company called Pinch, and our goal was to help Americans become more financially stable. And we started the company before we even knew what was the biggest opportunity to do that? Uh, we ended up really focusing on reporting rent payments to the credit bureaus, which is a financial inclusion play. People are building their credit just by paying their rent. And with a better credit score, you know, that gives them access to more affordable loans. But it's not just that. It's also access to better apartments and better jobs. Um, it gives them access to cheaper car insurance. I think there's all kinds of different impacts of having a better credit score that, that are not obvious at the first glance. 
Uh, then I sold Pinch um, to Chime in the summer of 2018. Um, and now, so I work at Chime. On the side, I do a lot of angel investing. And in terms of investing, I'm really most passionate about companies that are making um, the big expenses more accessible for Americans. So when you think about that, like, I'm sure you've seen the like, oh, it's like people are buying a flat screen TV with, uh, you know, with their welfare checks or with their stimulus checks or things like that. And first of all, you basically can't buy any other kind of TV besides a flat screen TV, right? Like that's the only type of TV that exists. Uh, but almost more importantly, it's like goods are really, really cheap. Like flat screen TVs are relatively cheap. Um, kind of everything is really cheap. And that's really been a product of the last you know, 30 years um, where all goods have gotten really cheap. And instead, the things that Americans are really struggling to afford in their lives is house care. It's house care, uh, housing, health care, it's transportation and it's education and the cost for those things have skyrocketed recently and um, Americans are falling like falling behind in their ability to pay for these like really critical services. So I love it. Like I love chatting about it's like, how can we make these things more accessible? Part of that is sometimes real focus on the money, right? Like how do we make it cheap, making it cheaper? Um, I think there are other ways to make these services more more accessible, work more well with people's lives. Um, I think the biggest problem with Americans' finances is that they're not making enough money. Um, and so I'm really excited about startups that are pushing um, income opportunities forward as well. Um, and so these are all the types of things that I think about um, on the side, right? While my day job is really helping build Chime into one of the most loved and trusted financial brands uh, that exists. Fascinating, my um, um, what a concept making customer happy, and then you're kind of from that you're going into making um, big expenses more accessible, affordable. And yeah, I know there are some root causes there where you alluded, and you can't control that. But but a great great objective, and would love to um, drill down a little bit as we go on today. Um, Shamir, over to you for your opening. Yeah. Um... So where to begin, right? Like I, um, I mean, maybe just my kind of uh, journeys. You know, I used to be a software engineer and, um, and then became a consultant for a while. Um, and then I just kind of stumbled into, into fintech. Um, I, I had some experience doing consulting for banks and um, I don't know, maybe what, what you could call old school fintech, you know, the Fiserv's and Visa's of the world. Um, but then in 09, a cl friend and classmate uh, from business school um, sent me an email and suggested that we should start a bank together. Um, and I was just completely, I don't know, captivated by the idea that, you know, that could exist a bank that was tech centric, pro customer and actually helped people manage their money um, the, rather than sort of try and feed them to death. Um, and, and that was just so alien from like the state of banking in, in 2009 that it was, you know, it was a very compelling uh, vision. Um, I got excited, started chatting with Josh and then, you know, um, co-founded uh, Simple with him in, in 09. And, uh, and, and, and I don't think we quite thought of ourselves as sort of like, starting the neobank industry, but but in some ways we did, right? Um, it took us almost three years from first email to launch. Uh, and that was because like none of the infrastructure that exists now existed then. Um, so like partner banks, processors, card issuers, um, you know, uh, our photo check deposit, all of these things were just like, in their infancy, um, and, uh, and and we had to figure out how to like uh, connect up all, a bunch of different solutions, and then build a lot of uh, tech ourselves before we could even get to the point where we were building web and mobile apps that customers could actually see. Um, it ended up being mostly my job to build that backend, uh, you know, architecture and. Uh, and uh, sign up those partner banks and figure out how to connect them with processors that they hadn't even heard of <laughs> uh, and, and make it all work. Uh, and in some ways, that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 10, 
12 years. Uh, I kind of like uh, did that at Simple, got it launched. Uh, then, you know, there was the exit to BBVA in 2014, uh, which I I think it's still the biggest neobank exit in the U.S., which is uh, which is weird, right? Because, I mean, obviously, com- companies such as Chime have are so much larger and, and have grown so much more, but technically haven't I, <laughs> technically no other neobank has actually exited uh, sure. till now. Um, so it's, a, it's something that somebody pointed out to me and I was like, can't be right. But it apparently still is. Um, and then in, uh, in 2015, I got excited about the idea of building platforms at BBVA uh, and so moved from Simple to BBVA and built a couple of API platforms for them in Europe and the US. Um, that you know, built and shipped the, those platforms, but then realized that like uh, actually scaling them is, a, uh, is, is something that just was never going to happen at BBVA. So got frustrated and left. Um, thought about life for a while and decided that I still wanted to solve this problem. I still wanted to make it easy for everybody on the planet to innovate and program with money so that you know there wouldn't just be one simple or one chime or, or one transfervise or Venmo or whatever. There could be a whole industry of them. Um, and, and so really that took that you know uh, infrastructure building skills and, and, and kind of built Scylla. Uh, launched it a couple of years ago, and we're growing nicely, and have a bunch of customers, and um, and we're just trying to kind of empower this fintech revolution. Wow, what what a journey! And and I know you've talked, Shamir, about that email, the Josh conversation happened almost 12, 12 13 years ago. Um, but fascinating uh, email leading to a company, leading to the first neo bank, um, maybe the new first neo bank exit and first and only. Um, fascinating. A lot to unpack here, especially around the your current j- journey about making money programmable. And if I contrast that with Maya and kind of she's trying to also get money to run further, especially for some segments. Um, and, and also kind of making customers happy, or if I can call it the design or the US, um, user experience. So a lot we can talk about maybe, but maybe just let's maybe get into that a little bit uh, on the two kind of, um, aspects there, programming the money and making money experiences better or frictionless. Um, so Shamir, if you can kind of establish some foundation around that, right? So what is program uh, or making money programmable at Sila Money? What, what is the vision or what, what, the, how, how do you unpack that? Yeah. And, and I, and, you know, we, th- th- there's lots of different terms that get kind of get bandied around in the industry, right? Like BAS or banking as a service, um, embedded fintech, um, uh, API platforms. I really like the term programmable money or programming with money uh, because I think it speaks to the audience, right? Like uh, historically, like b- b- uh, banking has been about bankers and bankers are people who wear suits and who uh, do very important things like keep uh, ledgers and, and and charts of accounts and um, and and you know the uh, and and then if you don't know how to use a banking service, well then you clearly need some financial education. <laughs> um, and and I think that's that that I mean that is probably the history of banking for the last well, who knows how many hundred years. But uh, I feel like the opportunity with the fintech and crypto revolution is to really like change that right and say like hey this isn't about bankers, but it's about people, um, the kind of the two most important things that most people care about as their, you know, physical health and their financial health, right? Um, and uh, it's it comes down to the same things. If you want to get more financially healthy, you should, you know, if you just like, you know, eat, uh, eat less and work out more and, and you'll probably be physically healthier and uh, spend less and earn more and you'll probably be financially healthier. Uh, but with the, within that broad kind of advice, there's just like hundreds, probably thousands of uh, different ways in which uh, people can improve their financial lives with the help of technology. Um, and we're never going to get there if we start with bankers who then try to take, uh, you know, that's uh, 18th century product like a checking account and and uh, and modify it for. Uh, you know, today's uh, 
you know, internet, uh, uh, internet centric, tech centric world. Um, so I feel like we, we need to get developers, programmers, engineers, uh, innovators to think from the customer backwards and say, hey, what the customer wants and what the customer understands is not banking. They understand money uh, and they understand financial well-being, right? Uh, they know it when they see it. Uh, and so if we can get those sorts of people into the industry, help them uh, build products and services that look nothing like traditional banking, um, that's where we, you know, that's where we can really change the world and make it a better place. And that's why I, I like to say that our vision is to, you know, help people innovate and program with money. Um, it's not to make banking a service. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's much, much larger than that in my mind. Uh, concretely, what we do, we're a rest over HTTP API platform that allows uh, our customers to uh, do KYC, KYB, ACH payments, digital wallets, um, push to card, card acquiring, uh, crypto payments, um, and uh, and wires, right? So we, you can, the different ways to connect into the uh, the U.S. payment system. We're U.S. only at the moment, um, and, and you know, and program with those payment systems using a, uh, you know. Uh, our SDKs and our APIs, but also using, you know, innovative blockchains, right? Like Ethereum, uh, we support all of that. Got it. Yeah, so the building blocks of money. But Maya, may, maybe bring you in the conversation. I was hoping you would violently disagree, but it, that's a hard one to disagree with. Where do you stand on that programmability in, in the larger scheme of things um, in FinTech? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it's like, right, it's funny because I'm really on the same page, but focused on a different piece of it, maybe. And really, right, Shumar talks about it takes years for them to build uh, simple. I think today people use companies like Unit to spin up a neobank in like a month. Um, and so, like, I, I, right, I'm almost the consumer of people who are working like Shamir and it's, it's saying it's like, great, like now that it's so easy to abstract away some of the rails, like how do we focus on creating a great customer experience? And I think I agree with Shamir that it, it's not coming from bankers. And even when you think of it, it's not because bankers are, are bad people or even incompetent people. I actually think they're quite good at their job, but their job is really about, um, right? Like, uh, deposits and lending. And it's like, that's, that's the business of banking. And that's what it means for a banker to do. And they're actually pretty good at that. And banking is a good business for that reason. Um, and I, I really think that now is the first time that anyone's really focused on creating a great customer service and understanding what that means. And so where we're at today is really um, that gap between, right, this 18th century product um, and even the infrastructure that exists, you know, I just gave um, just gave this talk at FinTech DevCon on really how to translate these ISO 8583, right? The like um, commonly used card protocol messages. It's like how to translate that into something that means things for end customers because they don't understand what a partial reversal is, um, but it's their money and it's a critical angle. And so you need to translate that into something that's going to make sense for them. I think we're feeling this gap between what products exist today and how the infrastructure works today and how consumers want to interact with their money really, really painfully. That's why there's this explosion of startups that are trying to address this um, and other products. Now, I think there's some world which where we could imagine, um, and people talk about, talk about blockchain's ability to do this, it's like, could we abandon a lot of the existing infrastructure so that instead of my focus, which is really translating these ancient technologies into things that work well for the end users, um, could we just build? Could we just build something new? And um, how do we get that to work within the existing players and focus on those interoperability issues? It's like you change you change out the problems that you're working on, right? So it's like you go from this translating horrible technology into good user experiences problem into how do we get merchants and billers and consumers and all the different players in like a broader payments ecosystem to integrate with our new technology. Yeah. Uh, and I think yeah, that's a, a, I was going to say like 
though I, I feel like those are different facets of the the same problem in some ways, right? Um, like the, the this is kind of my my problem with like some people in the crypto space, which is that um, they they I don't fundamentally believe that uh, you can build a whole new uh, pl- new ecosystem uh, that is completely divorced from the old. Um, and and I, I don't think many people are actually to believe that anymore, but I think some people still try, right? Um, and this is the thing about like um, uh, like like every payment system in the in the history of mankind that ever got broad adoption is is still with us, right? Like I mean, coins are like twenty seven hundred years old at this point. People still use those. Um, checks have been around for like two thousand years. Um, like uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we are still using some type of card like 500 years from now right um and, and the so max drive. Kind of, yeah i don't know about max drive but you know something <laughs> that looks like a physical card might be you know we'll be using it in some other uh, planetary system one of these days um but the uh like old payment system really just never die and and uh they just eventually sort of recede into the background and become like the settlement layer for the next payment system that's built on top of them um and and so the, the idea that you can build a like you can you can build email and 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 have like a you know uh, SMTP and IMAP and POP, and they do not intersect with the postal system in any way at all, and they don't need to, right? Um, but but that doesn't work with money. Oh. And with money, you kind of have to build um, payment systems in in sort of layers, uh, and then like uh, build connectivity into the existing systems, and then sort of suck value out of them. Which is kind of if you go back and look at the the history of um, you know things like ACH and checks and wires and um, and, and I mean, they used to use gold for uh, settlement before World War One, right? Like that's that's how things have always worked. So I, I I do believe that the crypto revolution can only happen by bec- by being interoperable with the traditional payment system, which suck, right? Like I mean, we do a lot of ACH, uh, and and Maya, I, uh, I I can sympathize with like uh, you know your your deep knowledge of ISO eighty five eighty three. Uh, it's it's you know if we started building a payment system today, we wouldn't build it on uh, that way, right? But uh, we, those are the systems that are widely used and ubiquitous and you have to be able to plug into them. You have to be, you have to interoperate with them. Um, it's like the, it's like like that old joke, right? Like where the, where, why did the bank robber rob banks? Because that's where the money is. <laughs> uh, why do you have to interoperate with banks? Because that's where the money is. Yeah, interesting. You make an interesting point there. I actually kind of need to underscore that, right? The the DeFi, the libertarian DeFi or crypto crowd who want to kind of get a separate infrastructure independent of the C5, if I can use that term, centralized or the existing rails and financial system. And you're saying they need to both coexist and, and obviously the inefficiencies and the friction need to be removed. And Maya, you, you, you're kind of taking the pendulum needs to swing, not on the product side, but on the customer side, so to speak. Um, so, so hyper-personalized um, experience. But, but where do you stand on this DeFi, C5 point that um, Shamir is t- um, underscoring? Oh yeah, uh, you know, I'm not sure. And I do think it's, I, I do think stuff is going to have to integrate with existing systems. Um, I think, and what I, I was just almost, I was sitting here listening to Shamir talk and I was kind of wincing because I was just imagining how painful that's going to be. And I think whenever, you know, and he's talking about, you know, it's like we had checks to the system and we had ACH and we had all these new things. I think there's never been a new system that's been added that without it being extremely painful for everyone involved, like involved. And I was even, um, right. We chatted about there's this new Amex Venmo integration that I looked at and I didn't even click on the, it was like, you have to click to enroll in Amex Venmo integration. And I was like, dude, I don't want to enroll. Like this just seems like it's going to be so clunky. Now, do I think there could be a magical experience in years that is based off this idea? Yes. Do I think it, we're there now? No. And I think this is true with both the crypto universe um, and everything. I mean, a firm is trying to give me a debit card to buy now, pay later at point of sale. And that's really clunky, right? Like the, all, all the people are trying to get me to pay with ACH 
for e-commerce purchases. And that's really clunky. Like, I think we have all of these systems that are trying to work with each other and it's going, um, it's going pretty poorly, right? It's edge cases all the way down. And that's what really ends up making a terrible customer experience. And so I'm looking forward to what it's like in 20 years, but I think that we're all going to go through some pain to get there. And and when I say we all, it's like consumers, it's every member of the ecosystem. We're all going to be like chasing down like new weird behaviors um, in order to like get to something that's more stable and, and we can rely on. And and this also goes back to the, the to the original point, right? Like Maya, you and I were joking about like um, that Amex Venmo integration. I saw it in Amex, I think like a week ago or something. Um, and I went ahead and I linked my Venmo account to uh, to my Amex, and I kind oh of went God, through the whole happened? process. <laughs> well, I didn't do anything with it yet, so it all I think it all works. But then until you, I don't know, right? But see, this is the thing about expectations, right? Like. It took me less than 10 minutes. I had to eh, probably like seven to 10 clicks, right? And I'm sure that for somebody at Amex who designed that process, that seems like a magically amazing experience. You were able to do it in 10 minutes uh, with like less than like 20 clicks. Isn't that amazing? Right, and like, right. And from, you didn't have to from, talk to anyone live and you didn't have to scan your driver's license and they're like, this is incredible. The future is here. And, and, and I'm like, well, why did I have to click on every, anything? All you needed, if you want to link my American Express to my Venmo, is you needed my Venmo user ID or name or handle. And I'm like, I could look that up. It could have been one click. It should have been one click. Um, in fact, and, and that well, yeah, I, would, I would even question, should it have been even one click, right? Right, uh, right, but right, right, right. It could be more than one click. And it could have been, like, so this is the difference, I think, fundamentally, right? Like, when you look at the best tech companies, the best, like, companies like Fast or uh, or, or, or Chime or everything, it's, it's, it's all about, like, removing the friction to the point that it is even, like, you know, you, you just think it and it's done. While banks are starting from the thing that, hey, we, this is a process that used to take months. We have now brought it down to hours. Isn't that amazing? And I'm like, no, that's, that's, that's not nearly good enough. <laughs> so, yes, I think people are going to be surprised to hear this because I've just spent the last, whatever, 20 minutes talking about customer experiences. Um, but I actually am going to push back on that a little bit. And I think us tech people... Um, we almost hold this idea of experiences being frictionless as the like ultimate dream. And that that's what we're, you know, you're looking to create. Um, I actually don't, I don't think that that's true. I think that's an outdated tech idea. I think it comes to us from the like web 2.0 era of social media and Twitter and Facebook and what they learned about getting people to sign up for products and that was, if you make it as easy as possible, you get the most people and everything works best. You make it as easy as possible to post, more people post. You make it as easy as possible to see new things, more people will do that. They use your app more, your app becomes more valuable, like everything is better. And so we, all these tech people, it's like we just repeat this to each other. It's like frictionless is better. Um, this is how to both like create better customer experiences and build a valuable company. I actually think that's no longer true. And it's particularly not true in industries like financial services and healthcare and stuff that like really matters and is deeply important to you. You don't actually want to make it as easy as possible because even then when you're thinking, it's like, well, what does as easy as possible mean? Like as easy as possible, it, it, it's almost um, kind of paternalistic to say, I know what the users want. I know what's best for them. I don't want them to have to think about it. I just want to make it as easy as possible for them to do. And I even think, I don't know. So my first company, um, we were doing, uh, it was a curated jewelry rental service. And so what that means is you'd fill out a survey, tell us about your preferences, and we would pick out jewelry and we would send it to you. Now, the tech anthem is like, oh, you want to make sign up as easy as possible, right? It's fewest number of clicks. You just think it. It's like not even one click, like you're saying. And then people sign up. And we did that. And to be honest, so we had this survey that we filled out with people's preferences. 
So there was a real sweet spot for this survey. So if we made it too long, yes, we would lose people. But if we made it too short, we would also lose people and people would be less happy. And what we really found is that people actually spent a couple minutes answering the survey. Then they had more confidence that we were well equipped to pick jewelry for them that they would like. Well, if they only answered a couple questions, they were like, there's no way this thing is going to be able to send me jewelry that I like. I'm out of here. And I think when we think about moving money around, or like I said, there's, there's other industries too, like your healthcare and things like that. If the UI can actually support friction in the right places and for things that matter, it actually leads to better outcomes for for the end users and for friction for it's like well do you you know and i don't want i don't even want to say like friction for spending money right like that's paternalistic too like you want to empower people to do what they want with their money but i think frictionless is not always better and i think we're starting to bring tech outside of just you know toys on the internet and we need to think deeply about our interaction models for doing so and even you know i'm thinking you know, one of the other core tenants besides frictionless is is better in tech is higher engagement is better. And that's also, that's another one that it's like, well, sort of, right? It's like, do I want people to be spending an hour a day in their time app? It's like, that's actually probably, it's, it's like, there's a balance here. There's a balance of engagement and friction how do you have friction in the right places? And it's a lot harder to measure the number of clicks or time to do. Um, but I think that's that's the important work um, that we as an industry are uh, are tasked with these days. Interesting. So so it, very very provocative there, Maya, in what you're saying, right? So traditionally, our, our podcast is, is that frictionless and and engagement. But you're t- uh, what I see you saying the overarching principle is about value to that end user, and you brought tied it to the Web 3.0, the creators, right? So the internet <laughs> users, so to speak, what's the value for them? That should drive the kind of the design principle. That's that's very fascinating. Yeah. I've never uh, heard it articulated like that. It's uh, actually, you were it trying was... to get in. Go ahead. Show me. Well, I was going to say it's interesting because um, uh, Maya said two things in there, which I I think are worth like sort of deeply unpacking. Um, one is that she pointed out that it's not necessarily like um, I I I I will uh, I will admit that like you know I have lived my life by the mantra that we should make everything much much easier and uh, and I'm really just like very glad that Maya included me in in the in in kind of the. Uh, the tech people and not in the banking people. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> hey, hey, listen, I have worked at a bank and um, and, and I also also written code. Um, so anyway, uh, but th- th- there's a question of trust which is intrinsic to financial services, right? Um, and sometimes, uh, sometimes, uh, like lack of friction. Uh, can reduce trust. Um, I remember we we noticed this in kind of the early days of Simple. Uh, we we had actually invested uh, deeply in um, building out our own customer service team, and and you know this was like 2012, right, and 13, where the mantra was like you everybody wanted to be like Facebook, like supporting you know a billion users with like 20 people in customer service, <laughs> uh, and and we were like no no we're going to support you know, 100,000 users with like 40 people in customer service and people were just in. But it meant that, yes, if you needed, you could actually chat with the customer service and it was way better than anything that the traditional banks could could even dream of delivering. Um, so we looked at it and we were like, actually, you know, signing up customers is one thing, but what you really want is more active customers, right? Like those are the ones who drive revenue. Um, and customers who had interacted with customer service were more active and had a higher NPS than customers who had never interacted with customer service. And so we were like, wait, if your onboarding process is completely smooth, you never have a problem, you never talk to customer service, you never realize how awesome it is. Um, On average, 
you are less happy with simple and you're less valuable to simple. Uh, on the other yes, hand, that makes so much sense to me. That it's like that was a trust building experience for somebody to talk exactly. to the customer service rep to have a problem, have evidence of it being solved. It's like this bank is going to show up for me. They're going to fix most- my problems. They're here for me. It's not just going to be like a too easy scam that's going to steal off of my money. Exactly, and that you know, it, it uh, we did figure that out, and we we kind of even toyed with the idea of like you know, in the first ten fifteen days, we should deliberately break something in the app uh, and give them a reason to call customer service, and if they then did, they you know we we kind of did it and we were like they did the numbers on it and we were like we'd have to staff up customer service a lot more but uh we probably could have improved profitability quite a bit by <laughs> by doing that because you know you get a lot more active customers right uh now we never did but but there was a whole uh thing right like if if you never had any problems you were probably less happy than the people who did have problems um because you you built more trust early on um, and so, yeah, the the uh, lack of friction can sometimes lead to lack of trust. Now, I wonder about that as well. And I wonder if that changes with generations that have like just grown up on the Internet and, you know, uh, and, and they they have no experience at all of like the traditional financial services world, uh, because I know that when I'm using uh, a, a tech app, and uh, stuff breaks, I have less trust in it. Um, on the other hand, that may not necessarily be true in the financial services world, but you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, so I'm of a different generation. So I wonder if that's how much of that is generational, whether that will change uh, with newer generations. Um, and in general, I feel like reducing friction is, uh, is a good idea, uh, but ultimately you need customers to trust you and you need customers to uh, value you and you need to engineer for that trust more than you need to en- engineer for frictionless experiences. Yes, definitely. I think we were not hearing you. Some of uh, our. Maya. Go oh, ahead. is my go ahead. internet go, go cutting ahead. out? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Yes, it's like the focus on trust is important. And I also want to highlight the thing you said about some of your users are more important or like drive more revenue than other of your users. And I think this idea of almost like all user engagement is worth the same is also a hangover from the Web 2.0 and the Facebook era when engagement from users was implicitly kind of what drove revenue from ads. Um, And today, like realistically, we're not in that same position. Um, We're not in that same position where customer service is just a cost center and all engagement is the same. And so, sorry, my dog is barking. Um, Yes, thumbs up on on that point as well. No, interesting. And I I do wanna uh, get in a couple of other questions too. We we were talking about that Amex, Venmo, uh, Shamir, I'd like you to kind of talk. I think I saw some recent announcements of for Sila Money with Arcus kind of uh, bringing in a lot of the remittances, uh, 18,000 billers and so on. So talk a little bit about that and, and why is that um, important? Uh, oh, yeah. So we, we um, you know, I, I like we, we believe deeply in a partnership uh, approach at uh, at Scylla. Um I've spent too much time watching uh, and, and, and arguably sometimes even trying to build platforms uh, that try to be all things to all people. Financial services is extremely large and complex. And, you know, the intricacies of like ISO 8583 versus NACHA versus, uh, uh, you know, 20 or 22 versus, uh, you know, the, the weird Fedwire format, which hopefully is going away. Uh, like all of that stuff, trying to be the best at all of it, I just don't think um anybody any any one platform can right um so we try to be really good at what we do which is you know um kyc kyb ach wallets and and sort of what i think of as the core payments infrastructure uh and then we like to partner with best of breed companies to do everything else um so we partner with uh, arcus which we just announced recently that's actually i think we got our first customer uh Scylla arcus customer live like early last year. So it's, it's been ongoing for a while. We just announced it now. Uh, we also partner with Lithic, which I think is one of the best card issuers in 
uh, in the US. Um, we partner with uh, Alloy, again, great company, love their uh, platform for KYC and KYB and, and, and really all things ID. Um, and we partner with Plaid, uh, pretty much the, the best kind of, um, you know, uh, account aggregator. And, and, and honestly, I think we have another 20 in the works that haven't been announced yet. Um, and, and I really look at it as building that ecosystem where our customers uh, can use us, but then also seamlessly and easily use uh, complementary products and services that they need as well. Um, I really don't want to be building, uh, trying to rebuild Plaid or trying to rebuild <laughs> uh, Lithic or, or, or anything else. I vastly prefer to partner with them. Got it. Yeah, and gives you the scale. Um, no, no, awesome. And Maya, this didn't happen recently. It happened, I think, a couple, a few years ago. But um, I want to get in a question about that. You were featured as part of the Forbes 30 Under 30, which is um, a big, big recognition of your work. Um, it, it's a remarkable honor as well. Um, why do you think you got the award? Oh, what an interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever uh, asked me that before. <laughs> Uh, why do I think I got the reward? Well, here's why I think I got that reward. Um, I actually don't think it was anything to do with, uh, like pinch or financial services or the product or the customers or anything like that. I actually think it was probably because, um, I've been featured in a, a, a bunch of sort of like PR articles and Washington Post and stuff like that about, how we hired at pinch and what my hiring philosophy is in general, which is, which is pretty different. And I'm pretty like, I don't, you know, I'm not into resumes. I'm not into traditional interviews. I think that the way that hiring works is really broken. I think it's very broken in tech and I think it's the worst for how we hire engineers. Um, I think it's an exhausting, humiliating process that doesn't do a good job of aligning like great candidates and great employers. And I think that it was designed in a time when employers had way more power over candidates than they do now in today's labor market. Candidates actually uh, really hold the upper hand. So that's my quick rant on um, hiring, actually really different philosophies on hiring. And so I wonder if it was, um, you know, there was like a spurt of publicity like six months, I think, or three to six months before they really finalized the, Forbes 30 under 30 nominations. And I wonder if that's how I got on their radar. And that then um, after I was on the radar, I was like, oh, and she's the co-founder of a company. You know, it's like, she's like a reasonable person um, from other perspectives. So that would be my guess. But, uh, you know, I don't know. And it's actually, there's a lot of, there's a lot of teasing about how ridiculous Forbes 30 under 30 is. And it's not even the 30 under 30. It's like the 900 under 30 every year. Uh, For me, it's actually done quite a bit. And the reason why is I went to a college that no one has ever heard of. It's very small and it's very new. And then I founded a company, right? So founding a company is another word for like making up in your dreams and inventing out of thin air, right? So nobody had ever heard of that company. And then I had founded another company. And so Forbes 30 under 30 really gave me a brand name to attach to my resume when I didn't have any other brand names. I think I looked um, to people who didn't know me. It was like, oh, well, maybe this woman is smart and interesting and competent, but maybe she's a scam artist because I don't have any like credible source of vetting her. And that was the first really like credible source that I had. Um, And so, yeah, it's actually done, like, I I feel like it's done quite a bit for me. It always shows up in my speaker bios um, and stuff like that. So I'm stoked to have that honor. Great, great. And and Shamir, I think you were trying to get in. You have a comment on why she got it? Oh, I I was just expecting her to say that I got it because I'm the queen of fintech. And that would have been (laughs) enough. <laughs> no, no, fascinating. And I, I know some folks raise their hands, and, and we're having fun here. I, I, I had a few rounds of questions planned. We'll definitely encourage uh, folks from the audience to come up. I think Piyush and a few others raised hands and then took it off. I'll, if you raise your hand, just um, 
back channel me, the little I am thing in Clubhouse or to Sri, you see her in the second row, um, that it's okay for us to record your voice. And then I'll bring you up um, in, in, in stage. Um, uh, maybe uh, get a little bit into FinTech. I know we talked talked uh, some of it already, but kind of we talked at philosophical level, um, but it's really heating up. I, I did see some venture or, or folks who track kind of investments and capital flowing into fintech, one in five dollars flowing into fintech. That was Q3 or Q2. And recently, 2021 is going to be a record here um, in t- uh, t- t- sort of venture. And there's some macroeconomic reasons for that as well. But in general, things are pretty hot. And NFT, Coinbase, just um, kind of an open sea competitor, if you will. So NFT is really heating up. Challenger Bank maybe already was hot. And you guys are very familiar with it. BNPL, a firm, and I know you alluded to that, Maya, earlier, but a firm and Amazon are partnering. So Amazon's obviously a big player. So what do you make out of all this? Do you see some breakout trends? Is NFT the the, the big thing that we'll hear more about in 2022? Um, but, but your thought? Well, I mean... Um... I think I'll pick up on one thing that uh, that Maya said, which is um, this isn't all toys on the internet now. And I think that's a really like powerful thing. Like if you look at the, I guess the first twenty years of the internet up until like whatever two thousand ten, uh, uh, all that it really did was like revolutionize advertising. Um, and, you know, Google built an ad-based revenue model, which still is the majority of Google's revenue. Facebook did the same. And uh, and, and and that's how a lot of the, the early, uh, there were exceptions. Obviously, Amazon was different, but a lot of the early la- uh, large internet companies were all ad-based. And now advertising in in 2021 is completely different from how it was in like, um, you know, 1990, right? Um Advertising is like a 600 billion revenue industry globally, um, which has been massively changed by technology. Uh, but global GDP is like 100 trillion, right? It's the, it, advertising is a very tiny piece of it. Um, financial services is like 17 trillion of that. Uh, and it's really financial services, manufacturing, uh, transportation, logistics, agriculture, housing, healthcare, those are the big, big giant pieces of global economy, right? And the internet hasn't really done much for any of those. Everybody from PayPal to Scylla uh, combined is maybe 1% of uh, global financial services revenue. 99% of it is still with, you know, the traditional banks, wealth managers, insurance companies, and and all of those. Um, so w- w- when you look at the like the fintech uh, and crypto explosion, you have to realize that kind of the 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 size of the pie is probably thirty times larger than in uh, than it was with advertising. And there were some very very large companies <laughs> built in in the advertising, right? Um, it is different, obviously. It's much much more important to people. Their money is way more important than their photos or their uh, online messages or ads or whatever. Uh, so trust is a massive massive piece of it. But I looking at all of the money that's flowing into fintech and crypto i i I actually don't think it's it's too much it might given the size of the price it might be too little interesting so we're at the tip of the iceberg in some ways what you may are saying maya what what do you say yeah i think some stuff um is going to be bigger some is going to die out so buy now pay later there's so much joking about buy now, pay later. I actually, I think it's great. I think it's a reimagining of credit in a way that makes more sense to people. Um, and it actually works better for them in their lives. I think it's something that exploded uh, when uh, COVID hit in, in March, 2020. And everything else that was sort of a pandemic explosion has started to die back except for buy now pay later which is holding really strong and and continuing to grow and i think it's really resonating with consumers um and i'm very excited for i mean i could you know and people are it's showing up in the numbers like they use their credit cards less they're preferring these new ways of credit more 
I think some stuff could die out. Um, I'm even thinking, you know, I started Pinch in 2016. And when we started Pinch, our first guess at to, to the product we built was actually an insurance company. We thought, oh, we'll build a modified property casualty insurance product, something like renter's insurance. It helps actually cover the, the real shocks that people face in their life. Um, insurance was, I don't know if people remember this, insurance was very hot then. It was like lemonade had just come out and raised a hundred million dollars. And at that time it was like, oh my God, this is the most amount of money. You know, it was like so much money. Um, and everyone was so excited about this antiquated industry. We're going to revamp it. There was so much enthusiasm. I feel like that kind of died. Nobody ever talked about like, hey, what happened to how we were going to remake insurance to fit better into everyone's life. Um, Lemonade like exists. It seems like, I think they went public. seems like a reasonable company. There's a couple other players in the space like Hippo and stuff like that, but it really wasn't as big as people thought. I think there's still potential in the insurance space, Um, but I think we could easily see some really trendy things. Um, Not going to name names, but die out like the enthusiasm around insurance in 2016 without much fanfare and and we just move on. So I think some stuff um, is flashy, but doesn't have long-term staying power with, with consumer behavior. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by the way. How so Maya, are you, a, are you a pro in short tech or an anti in short tech? So I think it's a good question. I love the Bennett, like the mm, sort of like the product benefits of insurance I think the next generation of insurance that really resonates with consumers, it might be so different from a business model perspective that we wouldn't even still call it insurance, even though it still provides some of the benefits of insurance. So I don't know how to answer your question. Like I love, I love the benefits it's providing to consumers, but I think the mechanism is maybe kind of shaky and um, we might need to provide those benefits in just a totally different way. Interesting. I see. Have so, I, I agree with Maya, by the way. I do think some uh, areas are overhyped. And uh, just because I think the overall industry has a long way to go doesn't mean we won't have like multiple boom and bust cycles in particular um, some sectors of it, right? I think this is now the, the third lending boom I've seen in the last 12 years. And um, there'll probably be another bust at some point. Yeah, no, interesting. Yeah, just like the dot com, right? That's the best benchmark we have, meaning there was a lot of hype, a lot of things went down. And I know I had to do a room reset at the bottom of the hour, but we were having fun here. So I, I missed that. But let me quickly do a thing and maybe just do one more or a couple of rounds of um, questions if we have time. Um, uh, folks, you're listening to the FinTech Talk Show. I'm your host, Patty Ramanathan. We're talking to Maya Bittner and Shamir Karkal. Check out our Substack for summary of all our show, including this one, and we're recording this. And the Substack website is fintechtalk.substack.com. And there's an upcoming crypto report, fortunately only for subscribers. Uh, It's a 40-page report kind of covering the entire crypto uh, space. Follow our club, follow our speakers, uh, follow me on on Clubhouse and and Twitter, um, same handle. And all links are on the bio. Um, Maya, you you brought up when you were answering the Forbes uh, 30 under 30 question around kind of credentialing or hiring, actually, but how how folks credential. I've kind of written about that and talked about that as well, more in the venture capital space, how uh, venture capitalists credential founders, how um, LPs credential managers and so on and so forth, and how there might be opportunities um, to to kind of improve. Since you brought that up in kind of the hiring process, right? Uh, as a foundation, I think there's a lot of opportunity, I mean, and it's not just one kind of type of minority. It can be kind of obviously racial minorities sometimes don't get get the best opportunity. It could be um, uh, young mothers or or other women, or in some case, special needs uh, children, um, kind of the neurodiverse individuals. So we've kind of amplified some of those kind of issues. But I'd like to hear from you, too, as to how you see and what can the industry, maybe the fintech industry, but kind of industry at large, can do better. 
Yeah, I think it's a um, obviously a topic I'm super passionate about. I think that um, honestly, I didn't even see a lot of the problems with hiring until I worked at a much larger company. And I see like it's really clear to me um, how we've ended up in the uh, unfortunate position that we're in now where there's not very much diversity um, and our hiring processes are are terrible for for everyone and not really meeting our goals. So, and as, as a small example that I realized recently, so uh, we use um, at work we use OKRs, right? Which is sort of the like project management planning and goal tracking system that uh, I think John Doerr brought to Google, um, and Google sort of pioneered. So, whatever we have a specific way of doing business. If I'm interviewing a candidate and they mention OKRs and setting their OKRs and meeting their OKRs, I think if I were very lazy at hiring, which um, I don't don't mean in a mean way. I think everyone is really lazy at everything. So it's kind of where we should start. Um, I am going to think, boy, this person, if I'm imagining working with them, it's going to be so much easier to work with this person than somebody who has never worked with OKRs. We're going to be able to hit the ground running. I'm going to be able to give them their stuff. I won't have to explain the whole backstory of how this system works. Um, I'm going to rate this person higher than somebody who has used a different project management system um, and isn't sort of speaking that same language. And I think we see that repeated over and over and over again. Um, And it, I don't know. I guess I just want to say it all sort of makes sense to me. It's like, oh, here's why we're here and why we're hiring people who look like us, talk like us, have similar backgrounds. Um, and we end up in, um, at the end of the day, like designing worse products and worse businesses because of it. Yeah, totally. So true, Maya. And like, this is, this is historically an industry that has, and then I guess like most business in the US, right? That's, Let's be honest, been dominated by uh, white men from Ivy League colleges. Um, the large portion of the investor community still fits that description. And it's no surprise that those, you know, those, those white men from Ivy League colleges have historically invested in white men from other Ivy League colleges uh, because they look like them, they know them, they understand them, and, and they trust them in a way that it's really much harder for them to trust uh, you know, um, uh, an immigrant uh, woman of color, <laughs> right? Who has none of that context. Uh, but yet you look at the US and now I think almost 60% of uh, women graduating, from, uh, st- 60% of students graduating from colleges are women. And in the next 10 years, it'll probably become two thirds. Um, so, you know, if if you're going to be hiring people, uh, if you're going to be uh, investing in people, if you're if you're going to be in in, in kind of in business, you have to figure out how to um, hire and manage and and uh, get uh, productive with like you know uh, women and immigrants because <laughs> otherwise you're not going to have a lot of employees, right? And so uh, it, it's no longer a choice. And yet I think a lot of companies are struggling with it and will probably continue to struggle with it. Yeah, the, the point around, no, agree, agree, Shamir. And um, uh, the point around laziness and, and maybe kind of impo- some biases that everyone kind of has, not not saying it in a bad way, uh, but we, we kind of have our experiences with us. So is there an opportunity for like, things like AI to help? Uh, it's a kind of a disruptive thought and maybe some folks are trying it, um, but it could, could that potentially help? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to hand it off to you, Shamir, to answer the rest of the questions today. I actually have to hop. I have a hard stop. So apologize for that. Thank you so, so much for having me on. This is an amazing conversation. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate getting this the chance to jam on the future with you guys. Thank you, Maya. So, sorry, we ran over, but thank you. No worries. Bye, guys. Bye. Uh, Paddy, I, I need to bounce uh, as well. But uh, I, I, I think AI is, is uh, it's just like another, like all tech, right? I mean, it's going to give you scale, uh, but it's not going to fundamentally solve 
problems, right? Like uh, so far, what we've seen from AI is that um, it 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 reflects the biases of the underlying data sets that you train it with, um, and those data sets are collected and and curated by humans and. The, the the AI magically seems to end up with the similar biases that the humans have, right? And so, um, it it uh, it it can, if you really work at it, uh, you know, help you a lot. Uh, but it doesn't happen by default. And just using AI doesn't make your um, biases go away. You have to work at it. Sure. sure. Uh, I have to bounce as well, Paddy. Uh, was a pleasure chatting with you and and. Uh, and thank you for having me and, and Maya, of course, uh, um, on this uh, Clubhouse chat. Yeah, thank you, Shamir. Look forward to kind of having more of these conversations. Thanks for taking time. And sorry we ran over. A any closing comments before um, you leave us in terms of your priorities or how people can find you on social media, where you are, if you want to just close it out with that? Oh, totally. If you guys are looking to work with payments and program with payments, yeah. Uh, innovate uh, any of that stuff you should check out uh, Scylla uh, it's you know SillaMoney.com on the internet my Twitter handle I mean you can follow me here on Clubhouse but my Twitter handle is Shamir underscore K um, so look me up there um, and uh, if you uh, we run a Slack group called Finnovation as well which has thousands of people in it pretty much uh, everybody in fintech is in there um, and so you know if you're interested in being part of that uh, DM me or uh, on you know Twitter or wherever, and I'll I'll invite you into that as well. And uh, you know, uh, yes, go forth and fix the world, right? Because there's a lot of fixing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shamir. Thank you for 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 your views today. We sincerely appreciate the perspectives. And to the audience, thanks for listening in. Ho I hope this discussion was useful for you. Um, check out our Substack, fintechtalk.substack.com, uh, if you missed part of this conversation or um, kind of recap of other conversations. And follow um, me on Clubhouse and Twitter and look forward to more Fintech Talks in the future. Thank you all.